Some of you have asked about my hair. <laughs> Even though I don't look like it, part of my background is Native American, Ojibwa Nation, actually just north of here on the Canadian side of the Great Lakes, an island called Manitoulin. And so um, a while back, I decided to let my hair grow just to honor that wonderful heritage. And uh, like my wife said, you'd better grow it while you still have a chance. <laughs> and you know, over the years now, it has been something of a reminder to pray for First Nations peoples that they might know the fullness of life that can be found in Jesus Christ. The first book which I wrote, Celebration of Discipline, I was living at a Christian camp at that time called Camp Tillicum. And Ken Miedema, who wrote this little song, came up to Tillicum and spent a week and at the end of the week wrote that little tune. Teach me to stop and listen. Teach me to center down. Teach me the use of silence. Teach me where peace is found. Then, when it's time for moving, Grant it that I might bring to every day and moment peace from a silent spring. And so now, can we begin by stopping and listening? Let's pray. <clears throat> and perhaps you might like to place your hands on your knees, palms down, as a kind of symbolic way of surrender, an icon of letting go. And if you've been faced with a great sorrow or an uneasy fear, we can say, palms down, let go. Maybe there's a concern at home or with friends, some relationship that's broken, palms down, let go. Maybe an anxiety about an appointment or, or some exam. Palms down, we let go. And then as we're ready, we can say palms up to receive from the Lord what we need today. For strength to face the tasks of the day, palms up. for wisdom or discernment about a particular situation. Palms up.
for the power of the Lord to be over all. Palms up. And now we listen, silent and still, for the Debar Yahweh, the word of the Lord. Hear now the word of the Lord for you. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Jesus Christ is alive and here to teach his people himself. He has not contracted laryngitis. His voice is not hard to hear. His vocabulary is not difficult to understand. Oh, I just wish that I had the words to share with you how much God desires our presence, how much God longs to hear from us how much God yearns to communicate with us. At the very heart of God is the passionate disposition to be in loving fellowship with you and with me. From the human side of this equation, it is meditative prayer that ushers us in to this divine human fellowship. But learning to listen well and to hear correctly is no small task. And while contemporary culture is good at training us in many things, it is not good at teaching us to hear God's voice in his wondrous, terrible, loving, all-embracing silence. And so we cry out in the ancient words of Jean Nicholas Grew, O divine master, teach me this mute language which says so much. And by means of this prayer, we are learning to quiet our noisy heart. We are learning to be silent and listen to God. We are learning to be in such a state of preparation that God's Spirit may impress upon us such virtues as will please Him. We are learning to let all that is within us be attentive to the divine center. We are learning to still all outward affection and of all human thoughts within us until we hear the call Yahweh, the voice 
of the Lord. And it is this learning process, learning, 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 that happens as we open ourselves to listening to the Lord. Yesterday I mentioned one thing about what we learn, not to be heroic in all of this, and I want to unpack that just a little this morning. Oh, in those early days, I was so serious. You wouldn't have liked me a bit. <laughs> and one day I decided I was going to go into a little room and fast and pray for three days. And I did. And I was concerned to pray for two individuals in our little fellowship. Uh, these were physical matters. I don't know what you think about those things. But that's just the way it was in my case. One was a older woman who was terribly crippled with arthritis, and I wanted to pray that she'd be well. The second was a young man that I was meeting with in hospital who was dying of cancer, and I wanted to pray that he would be well. Now, God did many wonderful things for me in that three-day experience, but the woman crippled with arthritis continued to be crippled with arthritis, okay? until some years later, God's friends, the doctors, w w had a new procedure that gave her sub substantial relief. I'm delighted. The young man in hospital who was dying of cancer died. Now, he came into saving faith before he died, and I'm glad. But you understand that my little prayer project did not work, at least as I thought it should. By that time, though, I had at least learned enough to know that it would be helpful to listen. So I said, Lord, if you have anything you want to teach me in this matter, I'll be happy to try to listen. Doesn't always have to be that way. I'm sure that there are many things that I simply will have to wait for heaven to understand. But I said, I'll try to be in a listening mode. The next night, Carolyn and I were in the home of dear friends, Dallas and Jane Willard. Dallas teaches philosophy at USC. He was part of our congregation. We'd been in many prayer projects together. And he was inviting me to go to a Lutheran church to hear a little old lady, an Episcopalian lady, speak on prayer. And I was hemming and hawing and trying to figure a way to get out of this. And Dallas just nailed me to the wall. He says, you know, Foster, the only difference between you and me and this lady is that when she prays, things happen. <laughs> okay, I'll go. But you have to understand, this was way back, 1970. Here was a Baptist inviting a Quaker to go to a Lutheran church to listen to an Episcopalian. <laughs> what if somebody saw me? I, big church, I hid up in the balcony. And here was this little old lady talking about prayer. And you have to understand my attitude about this. I listened for about five minutes. And I said to myself, I know more about homiletics than she does. She is going to teach me. And this is kind of the way she talks. She says, now, when you are first learning to pray, do not start with the most difficult cases, like arthritis and cancer. I asked her years later why she mentioned those two. She said, oh, I don't know. Cancer is easy to pray for. I knew why she mentioned them. See, I needed a teaching. She said, begin more simply. Pray for things you normally would never think of, like earaches and headaches and, you know. And, oh, this light went on. You see, this progression in the spiritual life. 
You don't take an occasional jogger and put them in a marathon race. And you don't do that in the spiritual life either. And so I begin learning slowly, just like a little child. In fact, little children were very helpful in those early days just to learn to pray. So we learn not to be heroic. Another thing we learn is to love the ways of God. You see, it's one thing to love God, and it's a very different thing to love God's ways. You remember the word of the Lord through Isaiah, where God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, says the Lord. You know what our way is? We like to get a hold of somebody's head and just open it up and tinker around there a little bit. That's our way. But this passage goes on to describe God's way. It says, like the rain and the snow come down from heaven, but do not return until they've watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose. You see, just like the rain comes, soaks into the earth, disappears, and up comes the life. That's God's way. And you see, it is in meditative prayer that we come to understand something of the cosmic patience of God. And we learn to wait and slowly to turn, turn, till we turn round right. And so we're learning. And as we're learning, there are three things that we constantly are doing. All through this process, we are asking, always asking, change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. Asking, always asking. And then we are listening, always listening. Like Elijah, we wait through earthquake, wind, and fire for the still, small voice of the true shepherd, listening, always listening. And then we are obeying, always obeying. We obey the Debar Yahweh, the word of the Lord. We obey the Zoe life of God that is at work within us, which has a principle of its own. We obey Christ in all things. We obey the Spirit at all times. We obey the Scripture in all ways, obeying, always obeying. Asking, listening, obeying. As I said earlier, to listen well and to hear correctly is no small task. The fact that God speaks to us is no guarantee that we hear correctly. <laughs> Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote that in his practice of contemplative prayer, sometimes it feels like, quote, twiddling my thumbs and shifting from buttock to buttock. Us too. How little we possess of a genuinely attentive spirit becomes painfully clear 
the moment we make the first attempt. As soon as we try to be unified and to obtain mastery over ourselves, we experience the full impact and meaning of distraction. When we want to be truly present to God, we feel how powerful are the voices trying to call us away. And everything then depends upon this attentiveness to God. No effort to obtain it is ever wasted. And as Romano Guardini has said, if at first we achieve no more than the understanding of how much we lack in inner unity, something will have been gained. For in some way, we will have made contact with that center which knows no distraction. So maybe I could just share with you a couple uh, small efforts in meditative prayer, just so you can get a handle on this idea. The first comes from my age. I don't know if you have any idea how old I am, but I predate all of you and most of your parents. <laughs> so in these days, you know, I have creaky joints in the morning. And so I'll begin the morning with just very simple uh, 15 or 20 minutes of stretching just to allow the joints to work a bit. And I end up flat on my back with my arms stretched out in a kind of bodily sign of the cross, if you will. Did that this morning. Then I will speak out loud the words of Paul to the Galatians. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives within me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then very simply, I will walk through the day. Who am I to meet? What tasks am I to do? And just ask, is there any guidance? Is there any word for today? And to be still and listen to the Lord. Very simple. You can do that. I can do that. See? So that's one little experiment. Let me give you another little handle. I use the Psalms. Of course, the Psalms are the prayer book of the church, aren't they? And we'll take a short psalm. Uh, don't use 119 for this. <laughs> a psalm of a dozen or so verses. And I do three readings. First, I simply begin and read the verse, I mean read the psalm, out loud. Recently, I did Psalm 90. That's the first reading. Then I'll be still. There's actually a, a word for this, Lexio Divina, spiritual reading. And then I will go back to the psalm this time reading silently, and I take a highlighter, and I will highlight any verse, any phrase that just strikes me. I don't worry too much about it. Just asking the Lord to guide and teach me what do I need. Just highlight whatever comes to my mind. And then I'm still for a bit, and then a, a third reading. This time I read only the highlighted passages, and usually one phrase or one verse will surface in my mind. In this case, it was verse 17. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, 
and prosper for us the work of our hands. Oh, prosper the work of our hands. And then I take that, you see, for the day. Might jot it down on a little note card. And through the whole day, let the beauty of the Lord, the beauty of the Lord, prosper the work of my hands. And then to be still for a little while before that passage and allow it to teach me. And so, we learn to stop and listen. We learn to center down. We learn the use of silence. We learn where peace is found. Then when it's time for moving, grant us that we might bring to every day and moment peace from a silent spring. Amen. You're at liberty. <laughs>